Hello there, welcome to the Retro Shed. Um, I wanted to say something about the loss of Sir Clive Sinclair this week. Um, not in a scripted way, uh, because I don't think that does the man any justice. Really, just my thoughts and ramblings about the news this week um, and his passing and how that has affected me and how I've been thinking about it. So. Uh, Thursday I was at a company bash in, uh, in Warwick um, and on the evening I wasn't really paying attention to my phone. Um, I was talking to my colleagues and having a drink and enjoying a drink and I saw on my message, um, and I saw on my Facebook messenger um, a message from Dave Rowland that said breaking news, um, the death of Sir Clive Sinclair. So I whipped the phone out, had a quick scroll through. I think the only I could only find one news article on it. There wasn't much happening. This was on Thursday, which would have been where are we today? Today, Saturday the 18th. So it was Thursday the 16th, I think. And my mood suddenly probably completely changed from being, you know, quite happy, enjoying the, uh, you know, the drinks and talking to people, and to one of thinking, Jesus Christ. Um, Sir Clive Sinclair, yeah. I think with with any celebrity death that you hear about in the news, it's always you're either bothered by it or you're not. You're indifferent to it, and I think it depends on how much that person had an influence in your life. And it's fair to say that Sir Clive Sinclair and his inventions had a massive impact on my life. If I go back to 1980, I don't think I ever saw a ZX80 until probably about 1984. I knew one person that had bought the Sinclair ZX80 um, and <laughs> he had it in a drawer, he never used it. I remember uh, it was a friend of mine that used to work for British Telecom and he pulled it out of the door, uh, he pulled it out of the drawer, a chap called Roy Broad, and he said, oh yeah, here's the ZX80. And I was like, wow, look at it, it looks awful. <laughs> it's like this, in, <laughs> like this vacuum molded or, in, I don't know my plastics, I don't know if it was vacuum molded or injection molded, but it was this white <laughs> little computer. I thought, God, that looks awful. I first saw a ZX81 in 1981. Um, a friend of mine had one for Christmas. And at the time, I would have been nine, nine or ten when the ZX81 was released this little thing um, and I remember going up to his house I think it was on Boxing Day and his brother had been bought uh, a ZX81 and it was set up in the kitchen on a little portable black and white TV and I looked at it and I thought that looks awful what can you do with that typical ten-year-old naivety really not fully appreciating what I was looking at at all I had a Philips G7000 at that point and it did sound and it did colour and it did video games. So of course looking at the ZX81 made me think, well it's not in colour, it's got no sound, what can you do with it? Not fully realising what Sir Clive Sinclair was trying to do, which of course was give us very, very affordable computing, um, especially in the UK. When you look at the price of other computers that were out at the time, they were very, very expensive, the, you know, the Atari 800, 400 they were well more expensive. Those those other offerings were much more expensive than the humble little ZX81. And of course in 1982 um, the ZX Spectrum was launched and Sinclair was much more to me about a household name and my love for computing I think was born around this time. I've, I've always been into computers because I'm a massive sci-fi fan so <laughs> growing up with sci-fi you saw a lot of computers didn't you? You saw droids, you saw computers, and I was always fascinated by these machines, but it was only when I managed to get my hands on them, an 81 and a Spectrum, I fell in love with computing. Not just the gaming aspects of it, the, the actual how they worked and how we made them work and how we programmed them and things like that. So the early 80s for me were a fascinating time filled with swapping games, talking about games, buying games, and Sir Clive, looking back, had a huge influence in the direction that my life took. I work in IT now, I've been in IT 29 years. <laughs> and if it wasn't for those early days, I don't think I would have done it. I wanted to be a pilot, but I can't be a pilot because I'm partially colorblind. So the likes of uh, the VIC-20, the C64 and the Spectrum really forged my path throughout life. And the news hit me quite hard on Thursday. Um, I'm trying to think of people that 
celebrities that have been lost throughout my life that have affected me. Roger Moore being one of them, I don't know. Roger Moore was one of them, David Bowie. People that I grew up with. And Sir Clive was a bit like... He was a genius inventor, but he was also like... <laughs> he was like your mad uncle, wasn't he? He was like... He was quite... He was 30-something years before his time. He was trying to introduce us to technologies and ideas that I don't think the world was quite ready for. Yes, the Spectrum and the ZX81, yeah, it was the right time, I think, for home computing. But ideas like electric bikes and electric scooters like the C5, personalised electric transport today is a massive thing. You know, you see these scooters all around the town. But the C5 was a nuts idea back then. It was never going to be accepted, was it? I remember seeing the launch of it and thinking, what the hell is that? Who in their right mind is going to go down the road in one of those? But had he launched that 30 years later, it would have really took off. So yeah, I felt quite melancholy for a few days now, and Sir Clive, what, what a genius. I was watching Micro Men last night. I love that film. If you've not seen Micro Men, go and check out Micro Men. It's the story of the start of the British home computer boom, really, and it's it's focused a lot on Sir Clive Sinclair and Christopher Curry and the guys from Acorn, and it's just such a wonderful, wonderful story, and, and seeing those machines and remembering the times when we could walk into Boots and WH Smiths and, and have a look at all these wonderful machines that were coming onto the market. Um, I remember seeing the Sinclair QL for the first time and thinking, I'm not sure if that's going to take off. I think had, had Sinclair made the QL backwardly compatible with the Spectrum, it would have flown off the shelves. But I totally understand where he was coming from. He didn't want to associate the QL with, as he said it, <laughs> Jet Set fucking Willy. <laughs> so I get where he was coming from, but I think had he made the QL backwardly compatible, it would have really flown off the shelves. But as such, it was pretty much a failure. I remember the first time I... I I bought a Sinclair ZX81 off a friend of mine selling one in around 1987. And for me, the reason I bought it in 1987, it was because it was a curiosity. I was using the MSX Toshiba HX10 at the time, which was quite a, um, quite a, um, quite a competent machine, the, the MSX, especially with some of the uh, Konami cartridges that were released for it. But I wanted to dabble with a ZX81, so I bought one off my friend for, I think it was 25 quid or something like that. And I set it up and remember thinking in 1987 how primitive it was. However, that aside, I loaded some games into it. Uh, one of them was a text adventure called Espionage Island, which I found really interesting, fascinating. Yes, it was all text, so your mind filled in all the blanks, but it was, it was really interesting to type commands in and try and work your way through the game. I think there was another one called ZX81 Invaders, <laughs> and it was just ASCII characters on the screen. And then I loaded 3D Monster Maze. And that really made me think, wow, 3D Monster Maze was brilliant. Yes, it was black and white. Yes, there was no sound. But when you were walking around that maze and you saw the dreaded line, um, Rex has spotted you, you started to panic. It's like, bloody hell, where is he? And you turn around and the last thing you'd see is those teeth closing in on you. Be like, wow. One of the first ever 3D games that made you actually think, have a sense of fear while you're playing it. I don't know, you lot might go, what are you talking about, Baz? It wasn't scary at all. But I don't know, for me, having that thing stalking you around a maze on a ZX81 was, was brilliant. And I also played um, Scion, uh, I think it was Scion Flight Simulator. Again, really good little game on the ZX81. So, yeah, I didn't think it'd be fair just to sit here and script off Sir Clive's achievements. Everybody knows what Sir Clive did. Everybody knows the Spectrum, the QL, the C5, and of course his legacy will live on for a very, very long time, probably forever. We now have the uh, Sinclair Spectrum Next that was released in 2018, which carries on that man's legacy. And uh, yeah, Sir Clive, thank you. You did an amazing job. You gave us not just Jet Set fucking Willy, <laughs> but you set us, many of us, many of my friends, on the path that we're still on to this day, still working with computers. What am I going to do today? I'm going to take a look at this. We were given this ZX81 a few years ago. I've never powered it up. It's been sat on the shelf here, um, along with the, uh, the wonderful Spectrum. We look at Spectrum games a lot. Lots of channels look at Spectrum games, but I haven't taken a good look at this. 
I don't even know if this works. So what I'm going to do today is find the power supply for this, uh, dig it out, and when I get some time, I'm going to connect it up, see if it works. First of all, see if it works. Secondly, I don't think I've got any games for it. Um, I'll have a look in the shed. I don't think I've got any ZX81 games, but what I'm going to do is see if this powers up. Have a bit of nostalgia. Have a bit of how did it feel to use the ZX81. So I came and had a rummage in the shed and I've managed to find a 9 volt ZX81 power supply, of course, which has the different connector on the end. And I found a plug as well because this didn't have a plug on it. Um, it's been ages since I've had to wire a plug up because, of course, everything nowadays comes with a moulded plug. So what I need to do is wire up the power supply um, and I'm going to check the voltage coming out of it, make sure it is 9 volts. I'd hate to blow the little ZX81 up. And then I'm going to whip the lid off it and just check it over, have a look inside, make sure everything's OK and just clean up this edge connector a bit. And then we'll, uh, we'll power it up and see whether the little ZX81 still lives. Right, I've uh, put a plug on here, so let's go to DC 20 volts, plug it in, see if it goes bang. Yeah, that's good. Can I hear it buzzing? Yep, I can hear it buzzing. So what I'm going to do, let me just put the phone down a sec. <laughs> okay, right, DC 20 volts, let's see what we've got coming out of this power supply. Do you know how difficult it is to do this with one hand whilst... I've got an idea. Hang on a sec, hang on a sec. I'll add a crocodile clips here. Right, genius, using my crocodile clips. Okay, so 13.5 volts, which of course is unloaded. So the power supply gives us 9 volts DC, at one point, uh, sorry, at point zero seven amps. And you're going to get that voltage when there's a load on the power supply. Of course, unloaded, you often see... Uh, uh, higher voltage coming out of the terminals so that looks good I shall leave that for now and let's whip the lid off the ZX81 and see what condition it's in looks like something has been living in here doesn't it look at that I don't know if there's anything still alive in here <laughs> let's have a look yeah definitely something's been living in here let's see if I can get this board out <laughs> So here is the Sinclair ZX81 main board, and look how beautifully simple that is. No spiders in there, by the way. Uh, what have we got on here? Right, so there's the uh, the 1K, if I can get it to focus. There's the 1K RAM, um, and there's the Zilog Z80 CPU. There's your Sinclair Research ROM BIOS, and the ULA, which was often referred to as the dog's body. Now that chip does an awful lot of work. It takes care, so the ULA takes care of the screen refresh, the I.O. from the keyboard. Um, it also does the uh, audio controls for the tape in, tape out. Does an awful lot of stuff. Uh, and there's the UHF modulator. There's the ports, so you've got your tape in, tape out, and your 9 volts input. Voltage regulator. Uh, with a little bit of aluminium bolted on to act as a heatsink. Uh, there are your ports for the ribbon connectors for the membrane keyboard. All in all, it's very, very simplistic. Beautiful machine. So I'm just going to give that edge connector a bit of a clean up, a bit of corrosion on there. Uh, I'm going to put it back together again and we'll, uh, we'll give it a power up. Okay, so I've given it some power, just tested the voltage. I've just got 9.7 volts across the uh, input. Uh, there's a 9 volt and a 5 volt showing on the regulator. And the heatsink is getting slightly warm now, so it's definitely doing something. So I'm going to put it back together again and see if we can tune it into an old TV. After a bit of messing around, I managed to get this. That is the best I can get, even manual tuning. So I think we're going to need a proper CRT telly. So I'm going to try again because that's dismal. Look at that. Right, so um, after a lot of faffing about with a collection of different screens, um, I, I use this old thing that I uh, fixed up, oh, quite a while ago now, and we have a problem. Not only does the screen display look not the best, but there's about two rows of keys broken, so I suspect it needs a new keyboard. Um, it connects to the main board using a very very flimsy ribbon cable and you can't buy the uh, you can't buy the membrane as a separate component you have to buy the whole keyboard so it looks like i'll need to invest in a new keyboard for the zx81 but 
all is not lost, I have another idea. I realise I do have a ZX81 apart from the ZX81, if that makes sense. It's called the Sinclair Spectrum Next. It has a ZX81 mode, so I've been having a play about with this. Uh, I do think there's some games on the SD card as well. Let's take a look. So this is 3D Monster Maze on the ZX81, and it's a game I've not played, I don't know. Um, it's got to be 30 years, easily, 30 years plus. Um, the keys are 5, 7 and 8 for left, right and forwards. Let's see how it plays. I mean, obviously there's no sound, it's a ZX81, and this was all done using um, the characters that were built into the ZX81, so... I'm just going forwards and wandering around. <laughs> oh shit, that's a dead end. Hang on. Ah, there he is. Can I run? Yeah, I can run. Come on, let's go. Oh my god, this is primitive. This is so primitive. Uh oh, hang on, that's a dead end. No. It's not the most responsive thing in the world. Oh, he's, he's behind me. He's seen me. Come on, run! <laughs> that is really sluggish. <laughs> it's really sluggish. Oh, there you go. I've been eaten. Oh, God. That brings back some memories. Let's have another go. <laughs> five, seven, and eight. Right, okay. Five, seven, and eight. Okay. Seven is straightforward. Where's the exit? This is so primitive, but when you think back to, my God, I'm lost, I'm lost. Think back how old this is. Uh-oh. No, go away. <laughs> no, it, um, I think it's very sluggish really sluggish i don't know why it's running so sluggish but it is i mean by today's standards it's very 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 primitive indeed and i don't know if it's this emulated version or whether the original was this sluggish but key input yeah key input seems to be really hit and miss i'm pressing the buttons and it doesn't seem to be responding i don't know it, it might be because it's emulated i don't recall the original being this sluggish either way yeah it's really sluggish <laughs> i'm sure he has seen me and if i could run i'd get away from him <laughs> come on run for god's sake where's the bloody exit does anyone remember where the exit is i don't he's seen me again oh dear <laughs> okay I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> so what did I learn from yesterday and messing around with my ZX81? Well, I learned that I need to spend some time uh, fixing my ZX81 because the keyboard's knackered. Uh, the RF output isn't very good. Um, but you know what? It was enjoyable to dig it out and have a play with it. I've never powered that one up before, so I didn't know what condition it was going to be in. As far as 3D Monster Maze goes, it's primitive. Um, I can't remember the year that uh, 3D Monster Maze was made, but when you look back and consider that it was literally, all the graphics you're seeing in that game are constructed from the character set that's built into the ZX81, it was a hell of an achievement. Um, it really was impressive. I remember powering it up for the first time, loading it up for the first time, sorry, and it was quite an achievement. Um, revisiting it yesterday, I found it to be very sluggish. Now. Somebody might want to comment below and tell me whether that was the emulated version that runs on the Spectrum Next. I don't recall the original version being that sluggish on the input on the controls, but on the Next I found it very, very sluggish. But it was a hell of an achievement, wasn't it? The ZX81, yes, it might have looked primitive, and technically it was, but when you consider the price point, I think Sir Clive had a vision that he wanted to get out there, and he certainly achieved that. The thing sold very, very well indeed. The one bit about Micromen and this isn't Micromen, this is for real, that I find annoyed me was when um, ghastly Barrow Boy, <laughs> Alan Sugar, rears up. And of course, Alan Sugar uh, bought all the Sinclair Spectrum technology off Sir Clive when uh, Sinclair Research went bust. Um, 
and he said something I've got it written down here so Alan Sugar said we are businessmen we're not made up by a team of ex-graduates throwing a bunch of electronic components in a box well do you know what Lord Sugar that's all Amstrad ever did if you look at everything that Amstrad ever did they threw electronic components in a box and I felt the comment was very very disrespectful to the pioneers that have gone before Sinclair's team and Acorn's team, Chris Curry's team, were a bunch of ex-graduates that threw components together. They didn't throw components together, they designed computers. They were pioneers, they led the way. They brought home computing to the home market, especially here in the UK. And although I respect Lord Sugar, he's a remarkable businessman. He's no pioneer, he's no inventor. He's just a market salesman at the end of the day. And for him to say, or to put down Sinclair's achievements in that way, I thought was pretty damn rude um, and a pretty stupid thing to say when you consider that's all Amstrad do throw electronic components in the box when the computing market was kicking off they released the CPC 464 uh, and I love the CPC 464 but it wasn't innovative it just took what had gone before and put it in a different kind of case with a built-in monitor sorry with a with a it came shipped with a monitor and it had a tape deck on it so yeah it was interesting to see Chris Curry's face when uh, Alan Sugar appears in that video. He kind of looks good. And yeah, I know how he feels. I think, I think um, yeah, I respect Alan Sugar, but I think he can be a bit of an arsehole at times. He can be rude, he can be belligerent. And do you know what? Just because you're rich, there's no need to be like that. For him to put down Sinclair and his team in that way, I suppose is like slating Henry Ford. The Wright brothers, anyone that's ever innovated and started pioneering. Yeah, I'm not going to dwell on that. So yeah, watch Micromen. Um, if you've not seen Micromen, I think it's floating around on YouTube at the moment. Watch it quickly before BBC take it down. Um, it's a wonderful portrayal of what was going on back in the early 80s between Sir Clive and the guys at Acorn. Yes, there's a lot of factual inconsistencies in it, but when you consider it squeezed down to an hour and a half, the, the general story arc is correct. There are some bits and pieces that didn't happen, of course. It's dramatisation and it's made for TV, but it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, drama film. It's got some very funny moments in it. <laughs> go, go and watch Micro Men. It is really, really wonderful. And I think it does give you an appreciation of what these gentlemen were up to back then. So yesterday, um, I asked our Facebook group for some thoughts and anecdotes on the passing of Sir Clive and what he actually meant to members of the group. And as usual, you lot came up Trumps, and I just want to read um, a handful of the comments here if I can, if I can find them. Here they are. Let me just read you a couple of these. Here here are some of the thoughts of the passing of Sir Clive. Um, Andy Johnson said, "I never owned or even used a Specky back in the day, so I don't have the nostalgia about him that others do. However, I do recognise the importance of what he did and how he effectively whoops gone off my screen and how he effectively brought home computing and by association gaming." into the homes of the masses. Without him, the gaming world would likely have been very different. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. Jason Birch, hello Mr. Birch, said his people skills were lacklustre, but he knew what he wanted. His ideas are still to this day very in keeping with modern product design wants. He was, in my opinion, the Ford of the consumer electronics industry for Great Britain. He has a lot to be recognised for. Yeah. Darren Pickerel said it was Sir Clive that brought the world of computers to me at 12 years old. If that ZX80 or ZX81 was not available, I may have taken a different path. I was into electronics, but computers were totally out of my price range and only used in business. School had a Commodore PET, but it was all about the home use and being given the opportunity to learn in your own time. I followed him very closely and it was only my money that stopped me from buying literally everything he marketed. Yes, my brother and I were also thinking about the C5. I loved and trusted the guy and everything he produced. An absolute genius. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Darren Branner said, I grew up in the Wicklow Mountains, middle of nowhere, no friends nearby, so evenings were spent with my specky from 1983 until probably 1990 when I went to college. Uh, a PC replaced it, but it came back about 2005. All those years moulded me into the person I am now. 
I spent over a decade working in the gaming industry as a result with the biggest companies out there. I'm now a senior software technical test consultant for the biggest company on earth, all thanks to my rubber key friend and Uncle Clive. Such a huge loss. What a great story. Mike Wilcox said, um, I know it was from the Amstrad years, but to me, even the 2 plus A I used for years had a bit of Sir Clive in it. Because of him and his vision of making computers affordable to the masses, we had some cracking games from bedroom coders who have now gone on to do some amazing stuff in the industry. Oh, yes, they have, yes. And helped shape me as, as the gamer I am today. I think most of us can say that, can't we? Baz Harding said, I got a ZX81 in 1983 and then a Specky a few months later. We played that until it literally fell apart. <laughs> Such happy times playing Match Day, Way of the Exploding Fist, Barbarian, Target, Renegade, and many others with mates. Would never have would never have thought back then that there'd be such an avid interest and communities because of his inventions so many years later. Now it's a good point. I've made many good friends in the recent years because of a mutual love for all things Specky. I don't think he or anyone could ever have envisaged that way back then and I hope he realised how revered the Spectrum and his other creations are, and that it gave him satisfaction, even games, even if games was never his intention, which is, yeah, absolutely right. <laughs> I think it grated him a bit, Baz, that um, the Spectrum was seen as purely a, a gaming machine. I don't think he ever had that intention. Spencer Guest, without the Spectrum being a thing, I wouldn't have the love for computers I do now, and probably not a career in IT either. It's an amazing piece of kit, done on the cheap, and it's capable of so damn much. Absolutely. I agree with so many of your comments there. So what are my final thoughts? Um, we've lost a pioneer. We've lost a revolutionary guy. We've lost a mad inventor uncle. Somebody that saw the future, but I sometimes think that the 80s weren't quite ready for him and his crazy inventions. Had the C5 been released today... I think it would have been much more readily available. Um, had he not rushed some of his products to market, like the QL, I think he certainly would have done uh, better than he did. But hey, do you know what? He had a huge impact on my childhood growing up. And if it wasn't for those early days of messing around with the ZX80, 81, Spectrum, and all those other wonderful machines, I would never have chosen the career path that I'm on now. And I probably wouldn't have bothered doing this channel. I'd probably be doing something completely different. So um, yeah, rest in peace, Sir Clive. Um, it's a huge loss to many of us that actually are involved in retro gaming and retro computing so um, yeah a sad week and you will always be uh, remembered you lovely gentleman you so um, thank you very much for watching you guys and we'll catch you again soon take care now bye bye